Book 11. Dawn left her splendid Tithonus in bed and rose to bring light to immortals and men, as Zeus launched Eris, the goddess Strife, down to the Greek ships, a talisman of war clutched in her hands. She took her stand near the great black hull of Odysseus's ship, which lay in the middle, so a shout could reach Ajax's huts on one end of camp and Achilles on the other. These two had beached their ships on the flanks, confident in their manhood. Standing there, she emitted a yell that rose in volume and pitch until it seemed to each Greek that fighting to the death was far preferable to sailing home in their hollow ships. Agamemnon boomed out a command for his men to arm and did so himself, strapping on sunlit bronze, his greaves first, works of art, trimmed with silver at the ankles. Then he covered his chest with a corslet, a gift from the Cypriot king, Sinyrus. News had reached Cyprus that the Greeks were launching a fleet for Troy, and Sinyrus sent this corslet as homage to the warlord. It had ten bands of dark blue enamel, twelve of gold, and twenty of tin. On either side were three enameled dragons with arching necks, iridescent as rainbows, that Zeus anchors in clouds as portents for men. And he slung a sword around his shoulders, golden bolts shining in the hilt. The sheath was silver, fitted with golden straps. Then he took up his shield, a crafted glory of metalwork, ringed with bronze, bossed with white tin, and inlaid with dark cyan a gorgon flanked by terror and rout, glaring out of the midnight blue center. The shield was hung with a baldric of silver, upon which writhed an enameled dragon with three heads twisting from a single neck. He set upon his head a two-horned helmet with four bosses and a horsehair plume that nodded menacingly on its crest. The spears that he took tapered to bronze points honed with light. The sky caught their glare, and Hera and Athena thundered in response honoring the lord of gold-crusted Mycenae. The drivers had orders to keep their horses in a steady line up and down the trench while the heroes moved forward on foot in full battle gear. The shout the troops gave when they finally charged filled the dawn sky. The charioteers let them have a long lead and then closed the gap from behind. Thunder rolled up from the plain like black dust, and Zeus, soon to be pitching strong souls into Hades, rained drops of blood from the crystal air. Opposite them, the Trojans on rising ground gathered around their heroes, great Hector, Polydamus, Aeneas, and Antenor's three sons, Polybus, Agenor, and young Acamas, all of whom could have passed as immortal gods. Hector, behind the perfect circle of his shield, shone like a death star in a bank of clouds, sometimes passing behind them as he moved from the front lines to the rear, issuing commands, and his bronze flashed like Zeus's lightning. Reapers are working toward each other in a rich man's field, cutting huge swaths of barley or wheat, and the grain falls in piles. The Greeks and Trojans kept coming on. Turning their backs would have meant a disastrous rout. They fought on equal terms, head to head, going after each other like rabid wolves. Eris looked on rejoicing, the only god who took the field that day. All the others kept their peace. Idle in their homes on Olympus's ridges, sulking because the dark cloud Zeus meant to cover the Trojans with glory. The patriarch paid them no mind. He sat apart from the others in glorious solitude, looking down at Troy and the Achaean ships, the flash of bronze, men killing and being killed. As long as the holy light climbed toward noon, men were hit and fell on both sides of battle. Toward evening, the woodsman turns home, his hands sore from swinging his axe and his heart weary from felling tall trees, and all his desires for the sweetness of food. About that time in the long afternoon, the Danaeans broke through, their captains calling, calling each other through the ranks of men, until their valor split the enemy lines. Agamemnon led the way, taking out Beanor, a Trojan commander, and his driver, Oileus. Oileus at least had the chance to jump down and face Agamemnon, but as he charged, the warlord's spear drove into his forehead. Oileus's heavy bronze helm had little effect on the spear's sharp point, which penetrated not only the helmet's rim, but the skull's bone, scrambling the gray stuff inside. So much for these two. The warlord left them there, their naked chests gleaming in the level light, and went on to kill Isis and Antiphus, two sons of Priam, bastard and legitimate, riding in one car. The bastard held the reins, and Antiphus stood by. 
Achilles once had bound these two with willow branches, surprising them as they watched their sheep on Ida's hills, and later released them for ransom. Now Agamemnon, Atreus's wide ruling son, hit Isis with his spear above the nipple, and Antiphus with his sword beside his ear, knocking both from the car. As he was busy stripping their armor, he recognized their faces from the time when Achilles had brought them down from Ida and to the beachhead camp. Imagine how easily a lion crushes a pair of fawns in his powerful jaws. He has come to where they lie huddled together on the forest floor and has ripped out their hearts. And though their mother is near, she can do nothing to save them. Trembling herself, she bolts through the thick woods and sweat glazes her skin as she flees the great cat. The Trojans were chased off, none of them able to help Agamemnon's two victims. Pisander and Hippolochus were next, battle-hardened sons of Antimachus, who in the shrewdness of his heart and in consideration of Paris's substantial gifts had argued against surrendering Helen to blonde Menelaus. Agamemnon now took his two sons instead, together in one car. They were trying to get their rearing horses under control. The reins had slipped from their hands when Agamemnon charged them like a lion. They fell to their knees in their chariot basket. Take us alive, son of Atreus, for ransom. Antimachus's palace is piled high with treasure. Gold and bronze and wrought iron, our father, would give you past counting once he found out we were alive and well among the Greek ships. Sweet words, and they salted them with tears, but the voice they heard was anything but sweet. Your father Antimachus if you really are his sons, once urged the Trojan assembly to kill Menelaus on the spot when he came with Odysseus on an embassy. Now you will pay for his heinous offense. He spoke and knocked Pisander backward out of his chariot with a spear through his chest and sent him sprawling on the ground. Hippolochus leapt down. Agamemnon used his sword to slice off both arms and lop off his head, sending his torso rolling like a stone column through the crowd. He didn't bother them further, but pressed on to where the fighting was thickest, Greeks in their leg armor crowding in behind him, killing Trojans on foot from chariots, dust rolling up from the plain like thunder under the horse's hooves, and all the while in the blood-red bronze, Agamemnon killing, calling to his Greeks the great warlord, like fire consuming dry manzanita when the winds rise up and the scrub forest is burned to its roots. The Trojans falling as they fled and the horses arching their necks rattled among empty cars along the lanes of war, feeling the absence of their faultless masters who lay sprawled on the ground, dearer now to vultures than to their wives. Zeus drew Hector out of the boiling dust, out of the blood, out of the noise and the slaughter, while Agamemnon pressed on, howling to his Greeks to follow him, past the ancient tomb of Ilus, over the middle of the plain, beyond the windy fig tree, they rushed toward the city, yearned for it, the son of Atreus calling them, calling, his hard hand spattered with gore. But when they came to the western gate in the oak tree there, the two armies halted, waiting. They were still, there were still some Trojan stragglers being driven across the plain like cattle. In the dead of night, a lion rushes a herd, scattering them all, though only one heifer will die. He crushes her neck first in his teeth, then greedily laps up all her soft insides. Agamemnon picked off the hindmost Trojans one by one, toppling them from their chariots, and was coming up to Ilion's steep wall when the father of gods and men came down from heaven and on to Ida's peaks in one step, a thunderbolt in his hands, and sent gold-winged Iris off with a message. Go, swift Iris, and take word to Hector that as long as he sees Lord Agamemnon storming through the ranks and laying them low, he should hold back and order other troops to engage the enemy. But when at last Agamemnon is wounded by an arrow or spear and mounts his chariot, then will I loan Hector's strength to kill and keep killing until he comes to the thwarted ships and the sun sets and sacred darkness falls. Students, make sure to mark page 204 as an important page. First stanza. Thus Zeus and Iris moved like rain down from Ida's hills into holy Ilion, seeking Hector, splendor of Priam's house, and found him standing in his chariot. Iris hovered nearby on windy feet. Hector, son of Priam, Father Zeus has sent me here with a message for you. As long as you see Lord Agamemnon storming through the ranks and laying them low, you should hold back 
and order other troops to engage the enemy. But when at last Agamemnon is wounded by an arrow or spear and mounts his chariot, then will Zeus loan you the strength to kill and keep killing until you come to the thwarted ships and the sun sets and sacred darkness falls. Iris spoke and was gone, and Hector vaulted from his chariot with all his gear, brandishing a pair of spears. He tore, he toured the troops and worked them into a frenzy for battle. A ripple moved through their lines as they turned and faced the Greeks. Over against them, the Achaean forces stiffened their lines. The two armies were poised for battle, but one man, Agamemnon, charged forward first, determined to fight war in advance of all. And now, muses, who reside on Olympus, tell me who came of all the Trojans and their famed allies to face Agamemnon. Get ready for a name dump. It was Iphidamus, one of Antenor's sons, a good man, tall, bred on Thracian farmland. His mother was Theano, and her father, Sisius, raised the boys from infancy. When he came of age, Sisius gave him his own daughter in marriage to keep him there. But Iphidamus left her in the bridal chamber and went chasing after glory when he heard the Achaeans were coming. He sailed with twelve trim ships, left them at Percoti, and came overland to Troy. Now he faced Agamemnon, son of Atreus. When they closed to within range of each other, Agamemnon cast and missed. Iphidamus stepped in and stabbed him just beneath the corslet, putting his weight behind the thrust and trusting his strong wrist to drive the spear home through the glittering belt. But the point bent like lead as soon as it hit the silver. The great warlord seized the spear's haft and, with a lion's ferocity, pulled it toward him and out of Iphidamus's hands. A sword stroke to the neck made his body go slack, and Iphidamus fell in a sleep of bronze, the town hero far from his wedded wife, who gave him no joy, though he gave much for her. A hundred head of cattle, a thousand sheep and goats, on promise from his countless herds. Agamemnon stripped his costly armor and paraded it through the Achaean troops. When Antenor's eldest son, Koan, saw his brother fall, his eyes stung with grief. Working his way to Agamemnon's blind side, he lunged with his spear and hit him below his left elbow. The great warlord shuddered, but without missing a step, jumped at Koan, who was now hauling his brother Iphidamus away by his foot. The son of Atreus's wind-hardened spear caught him under his shield, and as his limbs went slack, Agamemnon reached over his brother's body to sever his head. So Antenor's two sons fulfilled their destiny under the warlord's hands and sank into the gloom. Agamemnon continued his killing rampage with spear, sword, and chunks of rock, as long as blood flowed warm from the wound. But when the wound dried and the blood caked, the pain set in, needling and sharp. As if he were a woman in labor, struggling with a stabbing pain, Hera's daughters dispense when they preside at a childbirth. Agamemnon, in agony, leapt onto his chariot and told the driver to make for the ships, then boomed out a final order to his men. Commanders of Greece, the battle is yours. Keep the war from our ships. Zeus, almighty, has not seen fit to let me fight the whole day. And the charioteer lashed the horses on to the beach ships, manes streaming, chests flecked with foam, bellies dust-stained. They bore the wounded warlord from battle. When Hector saw Agamemnon leaving, he called to the Trojans and Lycians. Trojans and Lycians, Dardanian warriors, be men, my friends, and remember your valor. Their best man is gone, and Zeus has granted me a great victory. Drive your horses directly at them, and win the power and glory. He set them on the Greeks the way a hunter sets his grinning dogs on a boar or a lion, leading the way himself. Hector, son of Priam, peer of Ares, bane of mortals, falling on the conflict the way a windstorm falls on the sea and churns the violet water. He killed Asaeus first, and Autonus and not a few other Danaan leaders, Dolops, son of Clytius, Opheltius, Agalaeus, Asimnus, Orus, Hipponous, then fell on the common soldiery. Imagine the westerly squalls you have seen battering clouds in the silver sky, the waves curl and blister on the sea below, and lines of spray shear off in the wind. Hector's assault was much like this, with Greek heads toppling everywhere, he might have driven them once and for all back to their ships in a final rout had not Odysseus, 
called to Tadeus' son. Diomedes, what's the matter with us? Have we forgotten how to fight? Take a stand here with me. There'll be hell to pay if Hector takes the ships. And Diomedes, tough as nails. I am in for the long haul, but our fun won't last long. The god in the clouds has decided to boost the Trojans, not us. With that, he knocked Thimbrius from his chariot, a spear cast to his left nipple, while Odysseus took out Molion, his godlike protege. They left them there with no more fight in them, and moved on, working as a team, spilling guts like a pair of boars that fall on a pack of dogs, turning the Trojans back and giving the Greeks a welcome respite from Hector's onslaught. Two of their more notable victims were from Percoti, sons of Merops, a skilled prophet who would not allow his sons to go to war. They went anyway, led on by death's blackness. Diomedes robbed them of their lives and armor. Odysseus did the same for Hippodamus and Hyperochus. Zeus, observing from Ida, reached down and stretched the battle line out evenly. The killing continued. Diomedes wounded the hero, Agastrophus, Paeon's son, on the hip with a thrust of his spear. Agastrophus looked for his horses, forgot where his driver was holding them, and lost his head. He was dead before long. When Hector spotted Odysseus and Diomedes across the ranks, he mounted a charge. His shout brought with him battalions of Trojans. Diomedes, always there when you needed him, shuddered when he saw Hector coming on and said to Odysseus, who was a few yards away, Here comes Hector, like a damned avalanche. Let's hold our ground and beat him off. He spoke, poised his long, shadowed spear, and cast a good hard shot to Hector's head. The spear point ricocheted off the helmet's rim, bronze off bronze. Apollo had given him this three-ply crest, and never touched his skin. But Hector bounded back an amazing distance and took cover in the crowd, down on his knees with one hand on the ground. He blacked out for some time, and then, while Diomedes was tracking down his spear, revived again, mounted his chariot, and drove off through the throng, escaping a darker fate. Diomedes ran after him with his spear, shouting, Got away! Again, didn't you, dog? By the skin of your teeth, Apollo has bailed you out once more. You must be a regular devotee, praying each time you go out. I'll finish you off next time we meet, if I have a god on my side. Meanwhile, let's see who gets my business now. He spoke and proceeded to strip the armor from Agastrophus, but Alexander, Helen's fair-haired lord, was aiming an arrow at the son of Tydeus, bracing himself against a pillar on the tomb of Ilus, a Trojan elder in days gone by. Diomedes had unstrapped the gleaming corslet from Agastrophus's torso and was busy removing the shield and heavy helmet when Paris drew the arrowhead back to the grip, released the shaft, and scored a hit, the arrow passing through the instep of Diomedes' right foot and sticking in the ground. Paris laughed and, jumping out of his blind, crowed, You're hit! My arrow didn't miss! I wish it had gone in your gut and killed you so the Trojan could have some breathing room. They're trembling like goats before a lion. There was no hint of fear in Diomedes' response. You sissy, curly-haired pimp of a bowman. Why don't you come down and fight me man to man and see how far your bow and arrow get you, boasting because you scratched my foot. I might as well have been hit by a woman or imbecile child. A weakling's weapon is blunt. When I throw a spear, it kills you on contact. My throw makes it sharp, and your widow's cheeks are torn with grief. Your children are fatherless. Your blood reddens the earth, and you rot with more birds than women around you. When Diomedes finished, Odysseus stepped in front of him with his spear. Diomedes sat down behind him and pulled the arrow from his foot. The pain was sickening. He limped onto his chariot and told the driver to head for the ships. This left Odysseus alone. Every Greek in the vicinity had fled in fear. Troubled, Odysseus said to no one but himself, Now what? It will be bad enough if I lose my nerve and run, but worse yet if I am caught here alone, as I will be, since Zeus has scattered all the Danaeans, but why am I talking to myself like this? I know only cowards depart from battle. A real warrior stands his ground, whether he is hit or hits another. While he thought it over, the Trojans closed in, encircling their own peril. Dogs and hunters will go after a boar from all sides, and when he comes out of the deep brush, wetting his white tusks in his curving jaws, they charge at him, and although the sound of his gnashing tusks inspires sheer terror, they keep coming at him. So too around Odysseus, dear to Zeus, the Trojans rushed in. Odysseus sprang and hit 
Diopetes first, coming down with his sharp spear onto his shoulder, Thoan and Eonomus were no great trouble, and then he stabbed Chersidamus in his navel under his shield, and he leapt from his chariot. Chersidamus fell and clawed at the dust, paying these no mind. He put his spear through a man named Carops, whose brother Socus now came to help him. Socus was rich and well-born, a man the equal of a god. So put his face in Odysseus's and said, So, this is Odysseus, who can't get enough of cunning and trouble. Today you will either boast you have killed Hippasus's two sons, or go down yourself under my spear. And he hit the circle of Odysseus's shield with such force that the spear fought its way all the way through, penetrated the metal of the ornamented corslet, and ripped the flesh from the side of his ribs. But Pallas Athena would not let it pierce his inner organs. Odysseus knew the wound was not fatal. He pulled back a step and said to Socus, You're as good as dead, you sorry bastard. You may have put me out of commission, but this is the last day on earth for you. Flattened by my spear, you will give glory to me and your life to Hades, famed for his horses. This was enough for Socus. He turned to run. But as he was turning, Odysseus rammed his spear between his shoulders and drove it all the way through to his chest. He fell with a thud, and Odysseus exulted. Ah, Socus, death was too quick for you, and you couldn't dodge it. Your parents will not close your eyes on a buyer. No, birds will eat your flesh raw, fanning their wings. But if I die, the Greeks will give me burial. So saying, he drew Socus's, Socus's spear out of his flesh, and from his boss shield, blood spurted out. The pain tore at his heart. The Trojans, watching, signaled each other and advanced in a body. Odysseus gave ground, shouting to his comrades still on the field. Menelaus heard each call and said to Ajax, Telamonian Ajax, that is Odysseus shouting. The Trojans must have cut him off. We've got to get over and lend a hand, or the Trojan may, Trojans may overpower him. Think what his loss would mean to the Greeks. With that, he led the way through the turmoil, and Ajax, who was something more than human, followed. They found Odysseus beset by a crowd of Trojans. Yellow jackals in the mountains chased down an antlered stag wounded by a hunter's arrow. The stag has escaped the human and runs quickly as long as the blood flows warm and his knees have spring. Eventually the arrow defeats him, and the jackals tear him to pieces in the green shade. But then a mountain god brings a lion to raven them all, and the jackals scatter while the lion settles down to his meal. With Trojans all over him, Odysseus fell back on experience and instinct to keep himself alive, shooting his spear out whenever one of his assailants got too close. Then Ajax was there, planting himself with his wall of a shield, and the Trojans slunk off by ones and twos. Menelaus led Odysseus away, holding him by his hand until his driver wheeled the chariot up. Then Ajax attacked, killing Doricles, one of Priam's bastard sons, and likewise Lysander, Parasus, and Pilartes. A mountain stream swollen by winter rains empties onto level ground, sweeping along desiccated oaks and pines and other flotsam that it finally dumps into the spreading sea. So too Ajax in spate across the plain, killing horses as well as men. And Hector? As yet he knew nothing of all this. He was doing his fighting on the left flank by the banks of the Scamander, where the fighting was thickest. That is to say, around great Nestor and Idomeneus, it was there that Hector was engaged using his chariot and spear to terrible effect on the Trojan lines. Even so, the Greeks would not have backed up had not Helen's fair-haired husband Paris stopped Machaon from his valorous exploits with a three-pronged arrow into his shoulder. The Greeks held their breath, terrified that the battle would turn and Machaon be killed. Idomeneus called over to Nestor. Nestor, son of Neleus, mount your chariot and take McCann back to the ships. A medic is worth a battalion of men in pulling out arrows and dressing wounds. The old horseman did not need any urging. He mounted his chariot and McCann, Asclepius' son, in inspired position, got in beside him. At a touch of the lash, the horses stretched their necks toward the ships. Cebriones saw that on the other side of the plain the Trojans were en route, and he said to Hector, while we dally with the Greeks over here on the battle's edge, there are Trojans beating a hasty retreat, men and horses, before Ajax, son of Telamon. I know him from that wild shield of his that stretches around his shoulders. Let's drive over there to where the real killing is going on. His lash 
whistled in the air, and the horses, their manes streaming, pulled the chariot at top speed over the corpses and shields, their hooves gouging the dead. The axle beneath and the chariot's rails above were spattered with blood kicked up by the horses and turning wheels. Hector yearned to penetrate the wall of Greek flesh and scatter it to bits. The battle noise rose, and a moment later Hector was everywhere, making lethal circles with his spear and sword and massive stones, and avoiding only a single man, Telamonian Ajax. But Zeus, from his high vantage point, had decided it was time for Ajax to withdraw. As if in a trance, Ajax swung his seven-ply shield behind him, and with an anxious glance over his shoulder slunk away like a wild animal, turning around again and again in his slow retreat. Dogs and country folk sometimes drive a tawny lion away from a cattle pen. They watch the whole night through to stop him from sinking his teeth into the herd's fattest bull, but the ravenous beast advances away, only to be met with spears and firebrands, which he cannot face for all his hungry power. At dawn the lion departs in a sullen mood. So too Ajax, resenting every step he took back from the Trojans. He feared for the ships. A donkey is usually too strong for boys who try to keep him out of a wheat field and will wade right in although they break their sticks on his ribs. The boys keep beating him as he wastes the deep grain, but their childish strength can barely drive him out even after he is full. The Trojans and their allies kept up the pressure on Ajax, hitting his shield with their polished spears. Every now and again Ajax would remember who he was and turn on them, pushing back entire phalanxes of horse-taming Trojans. Then he would give ground, but even in retreat it was Big Ajax who kept the enemy from the ships. Big Ajax who stood between the Trojans and the Greeks, collecting their spears that were thrown hard enough to reach his enormous shield. Many fell short, sticking in sand instead of the flesh they yearned for. Eurypleus, you man's glorious son, saw the thicket of spears surrounding Ajax and moved over to help. His first throw hit Epasian, Phaseus' son, in the liver. The man crumpled, and Eurypleus left upon him to unstrap his armor. But as he was doing so, Paris Alexander saw him and drew his bow. The throw hit Eurypleus in his right thigh. The shaft broke off, but it was all he could do to drag his legs along as he made his way back to the Greek lines, shrinking from death. Then his shout rang in every Danaan ear, Achaean captains, rally around Ajax and see to it that this day is not his last. He's under pressure from all sides and won't pull through without our help. Make a stand for great Ajax, son of Telamon. Thus the words of Eurypleus who was soon surrounded by Greek troops leaning their shields on their shoulders and holding their spears high. Ajax managed to get over to this group, and when he did, turned and took his stand. So the fighting went on like wildfire burning. Meanwhile, the sweat-glazed mares of Neleus had pulled Nestor and Macan with him out of the battle and into the Greek camp. And Achilles saw them as they went by. Achilles was standing on the stern of his ship, gazing out at the blood, sweat, and tears of the Greeks in rout. And the great runner called to his comrade Patroclus from the ship. And Patroclus heard him and came out of the hut like the god Ares. This was the beginning of evil for Minotius' strong son, who now asked, Why have you called me, Achilles? What do you want? And Achilles, the great runner, answered, Son of Minotius, my heart's... Companion, if I have it right, the Greeks will soon be groveling before me. They've reached their limit, but I want you to know now. Go now and ask Hector, Nestor, whom he is bringing wounded from battle, from behind. It looked just like Machaon, son of Asclepius, but I didn't see his face. The horses went by at a pretty good clip. Patroclus did as his beloved friend asked and sprinted through the camp. Nestor had just reached his hut and was stepping down from the chariot with Machaon. His squire, Eurymaidon, unhitched the old man's horses, and the two dried the sweat from their tunics by standing in the onshore breeze for a while. Then they went into the hut and sat on chairs while Hecamede prepared a drink for them. This woman, who had long, beautiful hair, Nestor had taken out of Tenedos when Achilles sacked it. She was the daughter of a great man, Arsinous and the Greeks had chosen her for Nestor, their best in counsel. She now drew up for them a polished table with blue enameled feet and set on it a bronze basket 
and next to it an onion braided for their drink and pale honey and sacred barley meal. Then she set down a magnificent cup the old man had brought from home, studded with gold rivets. It had four handles with a pair of golden doves pecking at each and a double base beneath. Anyone else would have strained to lift the cup from the table when full, but old Nestor raised it easily. Into this cup, Hecamede, beautiful as a goddess, poured Pramnian wine, grated goat cheese into it, with a braised grater, and sprinkled white barley on top. She motioned for them to drink. They did so, and when they had slaked their parching thirst, they began to swap tails and were enjoying themselves. When Patroclus stood in the door, more like a god than a man. Seeing him, the old man jumped up from his gleaming chair and took him by the hand, led him inside, and asked him to sit down. Patroclus refused in no uncertain terms. No, thank you, venerable sir. No seat for me. I have too much respect for Achilles who sent me to ask you whom you have brought back wounded, but I see for myself it is Machaon, and I will bring this news back to Achilles now. You know, sir, what a hard man he is, quick to blame even the blameless. And Nestor, the horseman from Gerania. And why does Achilles feel any sorrow for wounded Greeks? He has no idea of the grief that has spread through the army. Our best men have been hit and are lying wounded in camp. Diomedes is out, and Odysseus, a good man with a spear. Even Agamemnon has taken a hit. Eurypylus, too, an arrow in his thigh. Machaon, here, I have just brought back with an arrow wound. But Achilles, for all his valor, has no feeling for us. Is he waiting until our ships go up in flames on the shore of the sea in spite of our efforts, and we are killed in a row? For my strength is not as it once was in my knotted limbs. Oh, to be young again, with my strength firm, as I was in the cattle wars with Ilians when I killed Itiamonius, the valiant son of Hyperochus, a man of Elis, during the drive back, leading the charge in the fight for his cattle. He was hit by my spear and fell, and the country folk all fled in terror. The spoils were corralled from out of the plain, fifty herds of cattle and as many flocks of sheep, and as many droves of pigs, as many herds of goats, and one hundred and fifty chestnut horses, all mares, many with foals underneath. We drove them all into Pylos by night, up to the citadel, and Nellius was glad I had done so well, going to war as a boy. At the crack of dawn, the heralds invited anyone who was owed a debt in Ellis to step forth, so the Pylians assembled and divided the spoils. Most claimed debts, since we were in Pylos. We in Pylos were few and hard-pressed, for Heracles had come in recent years and brought us grief, killing our best. I was one of the twelve sons of Nellius, and I alone was left, and others had perished, and boldened at this. The Apeans in Ellis campaigned against us with reckless violence. Well... Old Nellius chose a herd of cattle and a great flock of three hundred sheep, herdsmen and all, for he was owed a great debt in Ellis, four champion horses, a chariot team that had gone to the games to race for a tripod, but which King Augeas had kept, sending the forlorn driver back. Old Nellius was angry because of this and took high compensation. The rest he gave for his folk to divide into equal shares. We were in the midst of all this distribution and offering sacrifice throughout the city, when on the third day the Apans arrived, infantry and horse, uh, at breakneck speed, and with them were the two Moliones brothers, still just boys who didn't really know war. Now there is a town, Thryosia, a steep hill, way down the Alphaeus, Pylos's last output. There they encamped with a mind to destroy it. When they were through the plain, Pallas Athena, sped down to us from Olympus by night and told us to arm. The army she assembled from all Pylos was more than eager, but Nellius would not allow me to arm and hid my horses, for he did not think I understood warfare. Even so, on foot, I, disengage, I distinguished myself among our horsemen as Athena would have it. There is a river, Meneus, that hits the sea close to Arene. There we waited for dawn. The Pylian horsemen and all the tribes on foot, we marched out on the double with all our gear, and at midday reached Alphaeus's sacred stream. There we offered sacrifice to Zeus Almighty, a bull to Alphaeus, a bull to Poseidon, and a heifer to the, uh, of the herd to the great-eyed one. 
Then we had our supper by platoons and settled down to sleep in full battle gear along the river banks. The Apeans were deployed around the city, determined to destroy it. But before they could break, a great battle loomed. We attacked at daybreak, saying our prayers to Zeus and Athena, and in that conflict I was first to kill my man and take his horses. This was Mulius, Agius's son-in-law, husband, and his eldest daughter, blonde Agamede, who knew every medicinal plant on earth. I hit him with my bronze-tipped spear as he charged, and he fell in the dust. I leapt on his chariot and took my stand with the foremost fighters. The Apeans fled when they saw him fallen, the leader of their horse and best man in battle. I went after them like a black hurricane and took fifty chariots, and beside each one, two men felled by my spear, bit the dust. And I would have killed the two Moliones also, had not their father, the wide-ruling earth-shaker, saved them from war in a thick shroud of mist. Then Zeus granted the Pylians great power. We followed in pursuit across the great plain, killing men and culling their fine battle gear, driving all the way back to Vaprasium's wheat fields and the rock of Olin, and the hill that is called Elysium, where Athena again turned back the foe. Then I killed the last man and left them. Our men drove their horses from Vaprasium to Pylos, praising Zeus among gods and among Nestor. That is the sort of man I was. But Achilles? His valor is for himself alone, and yet I think he will sorely lament the army's destruction. Ah, yes, my young friend, Menotius, on the day he sent you forth from Pythia to join Agamemnon, laid a charge on you, mustering the army throughout Achaia. We had come to the well-built house of Peleus, and we found the hero Minotius inside, with you and Achilles. The old horseman Peleus was burning a bull's fat thigh bones to Zeus out in the courtyard. He held a golden cup and poured flaming wine on as the sacrifice blazed. You two were busy with the flesh of the bull when we appeared in the doorway. Achilles jumped up in astonishment, took us by the hand, and led us inside. He had us sit down, then set before us all that guests should have. When we had our fill of food and drink, I began to speak, urging that you come with us. You were both right and eager, and your fathers laid on you both many commands. Old Peleus told Achilles to be preeminent always, but to you, Minotius, gave this command. My son, Achilles is higher born than you, but you are older. Though he is much stronger, advise him, speak to him wisely, direct him, and he will be better off for obeying. Thus spoke the old man, but you have forgotten. Still, you should speak to Achilles. It is not too late, and he just might listen. Who knows but that, with the help of some god, you might rouse his spirit. You are his friend, and it is good for friends to persuade each other. If some oracle or a secret his mother has learned from Zeus is holding him back, let him send you out, and let you lead a troop of Myrmidons and light the way for our army. If you wear his armor, and the Trojans think you are he, they will back off and give the Greeks some breathing space, what little there is in war. Our rested men will turn them with a shout and push them back from our ships to Troy. This speech put great notions in Patroclus's head, and he went sprinting down the line of ships to Achilles. But when he reached Odysseus's halls, where the assembly grounds and altars stood, he ran into Eurypliaus's limping in from battle with an arrow in his thigh. Sweat poured down his neck and shoulders, and black blood pulsed from his terrible wound, but his spirit was strong. When Patroclus saw him, he cried out in dismay, Ah, oh, you Greek heroes, you were all destined to die far from home and glut Trojan dogs with your wh white fat. Your replies, tell me, is there any way to hold back Hector now, or will we all go down beneath his spear? And the wounded Eurypleus, we'll all be piling into our black ships soon. We have no defense left. All our best have been hit and are laid up in camp and the Trojans only get stronger. Lend me a hand here. Lead me back to my ship and cut this arrow out of my thigh. Wash the blood off in warm water and put some soothing poultices on it, the good stuff. They say Achilles taught you, and that he learned from Chiron, the just centaur. Our medics, Podalirius and Macaon, one is laid up and wounded and needs a doctor himself, and the other is out there fighting the Trojans. Minotius's valiant son answered, 
What are we going to do, Eurypleus? I'm on my way to Achilles now with a message from Lord Nestor, but you're hurting, and I won't let you down. He put his arm around Eurypleus's chest and helped him to his hut. His attendant, when he saw them, spread hides on the floor. Patroclus had him lie down and with a knife cut from his thigh the barbed arrow. He washed the wound off with warm water and patted it into a bitter root that he had rubbed between his hands, an anodyne that took away the pain. The bleeding stopped and the wound was gone.